Welcome to the video, everyone. Um, my name is Lawrence. I've got my friend Brad here. Um, and we wanted to basically go over both of our experiences of getting uh, vasectomies, uh, both in the UK. Um, we both got them on the NHS, which I think we'll go into more detail about later, just in case anyone watching this isn't from the UK. Um, but yeah, we, we both wanted to sort of go over our experiences um, and talk about the process. It'll be applicable to other countries as well in a lot of cases, um, just so that if anyone else is considering uh, getting one, uh, they can at least, you know, watch a discussion between two people who have gone through the process and, you know, maybe that'll help in, enlighten them on a few uh, questions that they may have. Um, so I reckon the best place to start is Brad, do you want to go over like why you actually got one and maybe how long were you considering it and stuff like that? Sure. So uh, I got mine, uh, we think it's relevant to mention ages. I got mine when I was 26, um, which is the age I still am. So it was four months ago at this point, I got my vasectomy. Uh, I had one because simply put, I don't feel justified in bringing someone into this uh, into this place <laughs> uh, I've never really wanted kids anyway but it was mostly for sort of trivial reasons initially like I didn't really want the responsibility um, but then came the reasons about the environmental impact uh, I think that especially living in a developed country having a child is the worst single action you can perform <clears throat> to uh, increase your input or rather your impact on the planet because uh, you're essentially doubling your impact, assuming that the child lives past mortality age. Um, and then I discovered uh, antinatalism um, and was just really convinced by the arguments there that not only should we consider the environmental harms our child will do or the harm to others, but also the harm that's going to befall them uh, as an individual. Um, so yeah, I found those arguments very compelling and that's why I had a vasectomy, essentially for moral reasons, um, as well as the environmental impact um, having a child has. Yeah, I can, mine were, my reasons were like very much similar to uh, Brad's. Um, mine was, uh, yeah, predominantly uh, the ethical reasons and then the sort of environmental and all other um, sort of confounding factors. and one actually that I've sort of um, uh, recently sort of come to realize also just having read Peter Singer's book, uh, The Life You Can Save is also um, me having just one child is such an inefficient way of, even if I saw it as something good, it's just such an inefficient way of doing good in the world because all the time and resources you'd put into that one new person could go to helping so many other people that already exist. Um, yeah, so that was just a, like a, a more recent addition to my reasons. But um, yeah, before I actually, I don't know how long yours was, Brad, but before I actually uh, got the op, um, I was considering it for about three years, I think. So it wasn't just sort of like a, a snap thing. Um, and then I don't know actually what finally made me get it, but... Um, yeah, I was considering it for about three years. And I, I think actually the thing that finally made me get it was hearing that um, both Brad and I have a, a mutual friend that also had one. And I think it was hearing that he got one. And I just asked him, you know, how was the process? And he said, it's actually like super simple. And I just assumed that it was really complicated. Um, and so that just sort I was just sort of like, yeah, screw it. And I'll do it. And you were how old when you got yours? Oh, yeah, I was um, I was 23. So I'm 24 now um but yeah I was 23 when I got mine yeah and that mutual friend was that George yeah yeah George yeah yeah so um yeah I guess it's similar for me but also you I think you getting yours but especially at the age of 23 kind of bolstered my confidence that I wouldn't be uh, rejected on, upon approve upon um, application yeah. I think that was that was my sort of assumption and why I never looked into it seriously um, but it was definitely something I'd thought about for a, a good couple of years and I was quite, I was quite set on, or at least I decided it was the right thing to do. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was like, I'd been considering it for a while and knew I wanted one 
for at least maybe a year before um, I actually got it. But the whole, yeah, the whole thing that was blocking me was basic. Well, there was nothing blocking me really. It was just my own ignorance. I just assumed that it was going to be really difficult because of my age. And then I heard about George and um, yeah, but um, like, I guess. Just, just, next- on, just quickly on that. Did you, did you hold off at all because you were nervous about, you know, essentially having an operation on your, on your genitals? Because um, I know I did, I did for a little bit. I, I, I remember yeah. saying to people, I know it's the right thing to do. I want it. But the thought of a scalpel, which it actually is not used anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought the thought of a scalpel near my bollocks was, <laughs> you know, terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it turns out that scalpel use is actually very, un- very kind of uncommon nowadays, especially in the UK. That might vary from country to country um, in terms of the actual techniques used yeah so for me in terms of the like considerations about you know being sort of like nervous and stuff like that um i was slightly i can't remember fully if it did make me delay significantly i think um i think i'd spoken to george and was already pretty certain that i was going to do it because in in my head And, you know, maybe this was just me being a bit sort of naive, but in my head, I was just sort of thought, you know, it's it's better to get this with the risk that there is of um, or, you know, the sort of the small hardship I would have to go through for, you know, however long the operation um, is for the benefits of having pretty significant peace of mind afterwards. Um, so it didn't put me off too much and then I actually saw a um, a post by I don't know if you know vegan space scientist Michael um, lives in Australia heard of the name yeah yeah so he um, I, I'm not sure if he actually ended up getting one but he actually around the time I was considering it he put up a Facebook post um, saying I am going to get a vasectomy later this year um, this is a Facebook post. Um, if anyone wants to try and dissuade me, please reply to this Facebook post or send me a message or, or whatever. Um, and, and at the bottom of that Facebook post, he said the the small consideration that I have for not getting one is the fact that, you know, there may be complications and I might be left with some sort of lasting pain or something like that. Um, so I had a bit of like back and forth with him about that and like ended up like, concluding that it, it it's a it's a really small risk especially with the modern technology that we've got now um mm. with the no scalpel um procedure and so yeah it didn't really deter me that much and you know every, everyone thinks that oh, i'm going to be the one that it goes wrong for and yeah you know ne- you, you hardly ever end up being that person exactly um yeah maybe the next thing we can go on to is um before we actually go into the whole process itself is uh like reactions and like how it it depends on who you are i guess but like if you told anyone that you were going to get one before you got it and like how they reacted if you want to share any of that i told a handful of friends um beforehand and no one was especially surprised because those close friends kind of knew my knew my thoughts on the topic and had done for a while um i think there was maybe a bit of surprise i'd actually gone ahead with it um but not like any sort of negative reaction at all i did decide to withhold that information from my family until after I'd had the operation and that was just because I knew they'd if they knew beforehand they'd they'd probably like worry about the procedure and get stressed out about it and probably stress me out um so I didn't tell my parents until afterwards um and again they they were surprised I went ahead with it but not surprised that I decided to have it if that makes sense um yeah a little bit of shock and I was a bit worried they were going to be a little bit upset to know that they definitely won't have at least biological grandchildren, but that didn't seem the case. They did, they did know my thoughts on the topic to some degree anyway. 
Um, but yeah, I'm glad I waited until I'm glad I waited until after the operation to tell my parents. Um, mm. But yeah, no, no, like bad reactions from anyone at all. Um, I made <clears throat> I made a Facebook post about it a couple of days after, and there was a lot of sort of positive responses and, and even a lot of people saying congratulations which at first I thought was a bit weird but then I thought well it is the antithesis of having a baby and yeah, it was yeah. my choice so why the fuck not you know congratulate that it was quite nice really yeah 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 so um for me I think I told um I at that point in time uh I was helping um, set up a, a like antinatalist organization so I was um, in like regular contact with the people that I was doing that with like daily so obviously I was like bouncing stuff on there off off of them the whole the whole time um, so so they knew um, but apart from them I think I might have only told a few other people I think I did I, I can't remember if I told you before I got it did I I think I, I know George. Did. I can't remember. I'd been talking to. There was one other person that knew, um, and then and then maybe you. But it was it was like you. It was a limited, like number of people, um, and then I chose to tell my family before, because I don't really know what to pin it down on. I think one, I just didn't want to be seen as sort of, you know doing it behind their back even though I don't think it is doing it behind their back and I don't think anyone else who didn't tell them before was doing it behind anyone's back um but I just wanted to avoid it being perceived that way and also um I'm living with them at the moment so you know it would be pretty hard to come back from it looking like you've just been fucking ab <laughs> abused <laughs> and <laughs> just passing <laughs> off as like yeah I fell over or something like that yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I get that in a practical sense, like, as you say, it would, it would be a bit difficult to hide. But what do you mean about doing it behind their backs? Because technically it's got nothing to do with them. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Technically it does. But I think, I mean, I don't know if it's our culture, if it's just human nature, but, you know, people feel sort of like somewhat um, entitled to know things about their offspring. Right. So if I was to move abroad, for example, do something significant like that, and I didn't tell my family until after I'd done it, they would probably react like, oh, what the fuck? Like, I thought, you know, that would be something that you'd tell me beforehand. Mm. It seems a bit weird. You <clears throat> didn't. I know with this one, it's slightly, it's slightly more sensitive because it's like an ethical issue. And also it does have like an indirect impact on, on them in terms of like you know they would have had expectations like i want biological grandkids and they're not going to get those anymore um yeah. so yeah i i think it was just to like reduce awkwardness and, and friction and stuff like that and the like um i uh i told them i think maybe a couple of weeks before I'd, I'd gone i'd gone through most of the process apart from the actual operation it was all booked in and i basically just um went to them and said uh look i've come to you come to tell you that i've like booked in a vasectomy um i've not come here to sort of you know justify it or or ask any form of permission or any anything like that um it's just to inform you about it um and uh my dad called me stupid <laughs> um and i think my mum was quite upset about it at least initially but um uh yeah and then after that it's sort of been fine really mm. Um, I think it was sort of the realization that they they maybe thought that um, my sort of views about it were um, maybe a phase or something, and then right. it, this was a sort of realization that oh, actually, it's not. It's like legit. Just quickly on that thread of this idea that it's a phase, can you even? Because obviously, you and I have both. Oh, you might change your mind. You might change your mind, yeah. and we don't even get it as much as women who who want to have these. Uh, equivalent surgeries but can you even pretend to like imagine yourself in a situation where your mind has changed and you're like oh no I was wrong we are justified in procreating and exposing someone to all these dangers to satisfy our trivial <laughs> desires to be a parent <laughs> um when you put it like that uh <laughs> that, was, that was a bit crass yeah <laughs> um 
to be honest uh no not really um and and maybe someone who doesn't think the way that me and you do would hear that and think oh well he's just being ideological and you know he's just blocking out all other alternatives but um genuinely like I've, I've thought about it for three years well more than three years now because it's like obviously been time since it's happened but like I thought about it for all that time and the time since and I I just I can't think of any the the only the only situation where it would somewhat hurt but I wouldn't regret it is if I'd met someone who I wanted to be in a long-term relationship with and you know spend a significant amount of time with or the rest of my life with and then it turned out like further down the line that they actually you know wanted to have biological kids and it was something that they they would leave me over that would suck but it wouldn't make me abandon my morals and i wouldn't regret it no. anyway. it, it would just be a bit of a kick in the dick no pun intended um yeah. so like no the answer to your question but that is the only sort of time i would think like it wouldn't really it wouldn't really make me feel um sad because i'd had a vasectomy it would more make me feel sad because either they hadn't been honest with me or well probably because they hadn't been honest with me because i don't think they they would have probably just been like suppressing the fact that they wanted kids and not sort of brought it to the surface when actually they probably should have um yeah i was but, gonna say now we kind of that's yeah exactly like right to the deal. beginning but yeah when you first find out that someone's infertile like you probably want to bring it up then but um yeah that's that's like the only thing um really other than that i can't think of any other you know e even if even if in some parallel universe i suddenly thought you know it's fine to create a new sentient being um you know like it, it, it it's not wrong not to at the same time so it's like i could i could just you know if i wanted to raise someone i could have i could adopt um or anything like that but no I just I can't see any I don't know what do you think uh for me no like, absolutely not um I was gonna ask you are open you're quite open to adopting aren't you at the moment as in yeah not I'm, now but yeah yeah not now it'll be a fucking bombshell now but um, <laughs> yeah tell me about it yeah like um it, it's not like the be all and end all like it's not like a it's not like a goal it's not like oh yeah i really want to but it it's like um it you know again if i'm in like a long-term relationship i'm with someone who i'm pretty sure i'm going to be with um if for no other reason for the kid's sake for the rest of my life i'm in a you know financially stable situation all of that sort of stuff and and they wanted to adopt then i'd i'd be up for it um you know mm. and obviously I'd, I'd try to give the kid as as good an opportunity as i could but yeah it's not it's not something that you know i'm not if if i die having not adopted a, a kid you know i'm not gonna cry over it yeah should we go into the actual process then um mm -hmm. so i don't I, i'm assuming the process was fairly similar for both of us so i can just i can go through um the the basic process um and then if i've if i've missed anything um then just correct me if, if there was any sort of like extra stuff in 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 your process um yeah or if there was anything slightly different yeah yeah so so basically um this is going to be uh a bit uk specific but i think the general sort of process is probably going to be similar um in most countries you know maybe there are some countries where the healthcare system is wildly different and there might be a difference between you know in in the uk you can get it on the public um, healthcare system for free but obviously in other countries you know you might have to pay for it but the process that I went through in the UK is initially what you do is um, you'll either be registered with a, a, a GP a general practitioner already um, if you're not then you'd need to register with your local one and then you just you start it up uh, start off the process by phoning them up and um, booking an appointment and you have an appointment and in the appointment you'd say you know i I want to get a vasectomy and they um they if you're young uh, like me depend it a lot of this stuff depends on the doctors you have and the people you come across because even though the process should be the same uh you know you know it's a set of it's a process so people should go through it in a similar way the process is is occupied and governed by individual people and people have their own views on this stuff especially 
something like a, a vasectomy, especially if you're a young person as well. So you may experience more resistance as a, as a young person, um, but I actually didn't. I, if anything, like they were gagging to get me through the system because at the time that I was doing it, everything had just opened up from the first lockdown of COVID um, or the second one, I can't remember, but it had just opened up from a lockdown. So a lot of people had, a lot of people that would have been getting a vasectomy had, um, had put it off. So they, they actually, like, I think didn't have a lot of people to put through the system. So um, yeah, phone the GP up. I might cut some of that rambling out. Um, right. <laughs> phone the GP up, um, tell them that you want to get a vasectomy. That's the first point at which you might get some resistance. I actually didn't. He just said to me, are oh, you very young? But, um, you know, it's your choice at the end of the day. So um, so then you, then your GP refers you to a, um, a body called BPAS, which um, I can't remember what that stands for, but it's BPAS. And they basically deal with everything fertility related um, in the healthcare system in, in the UK. So that is abortions, you know, anything to do with pregnancies, uh, other types of contraception and vasectomies and stuff like that. And they refer you, you phone them up and um, you say, hi, um, this is my like referral code. Um, uh, can I start the process for getting a vasectomy? They then uh, book you in to have a consultation with a nurse. So you're, you're, after that phone call, you're given, with, you're given a date um, that you have a phone call or, or a face-to-face -face meeting with a nurse. The nurse then... Um, tells you what the process involves and what a vasectomy actually is, tells you about all the risks, um, you know, what it is, what it isn't. Um, so like one of the things they tell you is obviously a vasectomy will prevent pregnancy, but it doesn't prevent you from getting like STIs or STDs, um, which I didn't actually realize they'd have to tell people that because it seems so <laughs> obvious. But um, yeah, so the nurse will go through all of that stuff with you and also will ask you questions like, um, you know, are you in a relationship? Have you already had kids? Do you feel like you've been coerced into making this decision? Um, have you ever been abused in a relationship? How was your family life when you were younger? It, it's not too invasive. Like, if you give an answer, they'll accept the answer. They don't really press you on it, or at least they didn't for me. Um, but yeah, they they ask those sort of questions because I, I think they have to because the standard procedure they, you know, because they they try to avoid people going through the system, regretting it later on, and then maybe trying to sue them or take legal action and stuff. So then you have the consult. Yeah, you've had the consultation with the nurse. Um, if the nurse is all happy um, and you agree, they then book you in for an actual procedure. Um, I can't remember how long mine was after the uh, after the consultation, but my whole process from an initially having my appointment with the GP to having the actual operation was, I think, about a month, a month and a half. It, it wasn't long at all. Um, it was pretty it was pretty quick. Um, yeah, that was the whole process up until the operation. But before we go into the actual operation, was there anything like you wanted to add or anything, uh, Brad? Um... I guess mine was ever so slightly different. Um, so yeah, I contacted my GP initially and said I want to get a vasectomy. Um, they arranged a phone call with someone. I, I can't remember if it was BPAS or a nurse or whatever, but it was just a sort of short five, 10 minute phone call. Um, uh, it sounds like your version of that, they explained the operation and everything. I didn't have that. That was just the moment where they asked the questions. And mm. um, like you said, are you in a relationship? Um, what else would I, was I asked? Oh, yeah, of course, the one about STDs. And I, I remember the, the bloke on the phone, he, he was <clears throat> he was reading these questions off of a, a sheet, obviously. And he did say, like, I feel stupid even reading this one out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we had that one. Uh, I think he asked me, are you concerned that it would affect your future relationships? I said, no. Um, you know, I'm obviously happy to have that discussion if I did meet someone, but it wouldn't, the thought of that doesn't sway me at all. Um, and then after that call, I received a text where I could book from, I think, four different surgeries. So I just picked the one closest to me. 
uh, and then the next stage was the operation but I had the consultation on that day uh, just before the operation where they ran through the the procedure itself uh, and the time scale for me I think from that initial call to operation was about three months so again not too long yeah I would say like uh, I yeah I didn't get that you know how you said you had a text with options mm. I didn't get presented options I was just sort of told you know this is the one that you're going to get it at. my mine was the one in uh, in Stratford in London um, maybe if I'd have asked like they would have let me you know go to another one but um mm. yeah they just, yeah yeah Sounds yeah well let's yeah let's go over what a vasectomy actually is generally in layman's terms and like anyone watching this remember that neither of us like medically qualified or any anything like that um do you want to explain or shall i i'll, I'll give it a go and you can yeah, correct me when i get it wrong basically um, they get a hammer mate <laughs> <laughs> um so as we kind of referred to earlier scalpel um, used to be involved but it doesn't seem to be the case anymore um, I believe they use this sort of tool that essentially stretches a tiny hole into the scrotum uh, and through that hole they pull out the is it the vas deferens tube and you've got one on each side and this is the tube that carries the sperm uh, where does it carry it from and to? I can't remember. Uh, it could, well, yeah, maybe this is um, something to like, uh, like explain in more detail because I've explained this to a few people before and they didn't, they actually had no idea. Um, and, and like, I, I've explained this to people who are like 40 and 50 and they didn't know. Um, so basically uh, the, the testicles, right, uh, produce sperm and then the sperm will travel up the the uh, I don't actually know how to say it, but the vas deferens yeah. that Brad just mentioned, which are tubes basically, and then they connect to another tube, which is where they meet. Um, and and the sperm are obviously the you know the the tiny um, tadpole looking uh, things that you know everyone sort of knows what they look like. Um, they then meet, so they travel up the vas deferens, um, if I'm saying that correctly, and and they enter into another tube where they meet uh semen which is basically like the liquid that carries them right so like when a guy ejaculates um I, apparently a lot of, i i for some reason always knew this i th just thought this was common knowledge but apparently some people don't know it like when a guy ejaculates there are two things in there there's semen and there's sperm the thing you can see is this is the semen um you can't see the sperm because they're like microscopic they're tiny um yeah, the, the semen is produced somewhere else in the body. I don't know exactly what the organ is called that produces it, um, but basically what a vasectomy does is cuts um, the tube that the sperm travels through to meet the semen, and they, they take out a section of it. So you end up with two, two ends of the, um, of the tube that aren't connected anymore, and they're, and they're closed at the end. So the sperm they're effectively cauterized, aren't they? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're cauterized. Then, I, yeah, I, I will get onto this later. But actually, in in my procedure, the guy actually showed me mine, which I wish he hadn't, but whatever. Oh, I'm kind of jealous. Yeah, he like picked them up, and he was like, "Yeah, mate, I've just taken this out of you," and I was like, "Yeah, cheers." I actually wished that I'd taken a jar to keep them because I, oh, I'm so weird. Good. I do, I do that sort of thing, and um, but I didn't, and I feel quite deprived. There's no fucking way I would have done that. Um, <laughs> mine, mine are in a landfill somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now yours have composted by now. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, yeah, that's basically how it works. So the, the reason that you become sterile is because the thing that um, the, the sperm is the gamete, right? So to, to, to make a, a, a baby, obviously an, an egg from a female and a sperm from a male have to you know, come together. And when you ejaculate, there's the semen and the sperm. And all of all a um, all a vasectomy does is blocks the sperm from getting in the semen. So when you ejaculate, it's just semen, and it looks exactly mm. the same. Um, yeah, it, it's just not fertile, basically. Um, I think, think that, that might be. I think that might be a point to highlight because I did wonder myself after the procedure: would I produce any ejaculate? And of course, we do. It still it looks the same, yeah. um, and everything in that regard feels the same. It's just there's no sperm in in the semen itself. We still we're still producing sperm. It's just mm. the sperm can't reach our yeah, exactly. semen effectively. 
yeah yeah exactly yeah 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 so yeah maybe this is another thing to to highlight is there's no um there's no uh, impact or, or there shouldn't be any unless there's complications obviously you've always got to put that caveat but um in theory and for the majority of people who go through the procedure there's no change in like sexual function um or like visually everything looks the same it, it it's just functionally like the stuff you ejaculate is is not gonna you know it's not gonna get anyone pregnant basically so um i'm just thinking is there anything else that we need to know maybe to say just about? like our experience on the day yeah go on then yeah yeah, yeah. so, I, so I got a, fr uh, a friend gave me a lift to the um to the surgery because you don't want you don't really want to be unless it's literally around the corner you don't really want to be walking or cycling afterwards uh so yeah my friend gave me a lift and then picked me up um but yeah on the way I was pretty nervous I was kind of having to focus on breathing um but yeah I, I got to the surgery I had to fill out a little form I think um and then that was when I had the consultation that I mentioned and um again I, I was kind of asked to reaffirm my reasons and I was quite quite uh clear quite uh quite strong on the point that I I thought it was a bad thing to bring someone into this world especially with the, the climate crisis situation uh and I think that was understood by the by the doctor the person who gave me the consultation was the one performing the surgery um he did say that usually he had an assistant when he performed these but it was only him on that day um and the reason that that came up is because I actually asked him if I could wear headphones during the procedure and listen to music to kind of put my mind at ease. And he said, if I had my assistant, then yes. Um, but because it's just us two, I want to be able to talk to you to see how you're doing. Um, ideally not. So, yeah, that was just kind of something I, th I thought to ask. Um, but yeah, then we went to the, the surgery room. He got me to lay down on the, the kind of not table, but, you know, the long chair thing uh pull my pants down I had to cover my my penis with a piece of paper or something um and then he got to work and yeah we were just kind of he was obviously sort of trying to engage me in conversation to keep my mind elsewhere um and I was I was nervous I was kind of looking up at the up at the up at the ceiling and I had my hands sort of on my forehead and I was feeling quite sweaty because it's just the idea of someone doing that to yeah, you know yeah. a very a very kind of sensitive area but I think it took between 10 and 15 minutes um and I I remember like afterwards I was sort of a little bit emotional when I was like saying something like genuinely thank you so much um because it's obviously oh so you mean emotional because it's finally done rather than you were nervous uh, at that point, yeah, afterwards, yeah. Uh, and I don't mind showing this. I did actually cry when I got home. Uh, oh, really? I don't cry. Yeah, I don't cry often at all. Um, but I think it was just, I think it was a mixture of of relief, but also recognising the gravity of what I, I'd just done. Hmm. Like, you know, it's a fucking big deal. Um, so, yeah, I did, uh, I did have a little cry. But uh, a, a good cry, not a sort of oh, yeah. any regretful at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like I won't go through all of mine because like I'll just be repeating what you said, but like there are a couple of differences with mine. So on the day when I turned up, I was the only person there. It was just me and and the staff. I didn't see Same. anyone come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I maybe that was to do with COVID. I don't know. Um, so maybe they had like reduced capacity. But yeah, I arrived. I was waiting for maybe like 20 minutes. Um, I didn't have the consultation on the day. So that was like a difference. I had mine previous or prior to that. Um, I got taken into a side room by, um, I don't know what she was, if she was a doctor or a nurse or, or whatever, but um, this, uh, this like health professional. And um, she just asked me a couple of questions like, you know, are you sure about this, et cetera, et cetera got me to sign a form as well um which i can't remember what it was but i think it's it was probably something along the lines of like are you gonna you're not gonna sue us and stuff like this and you you know recognize that this is a big deal and you're definitely sure and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. um yeah and then when i signed that she was like right well you can come through and we can start i went into this um 
yeah room where there was the the lying down chair thing and then the other difference with yours was that um the surgeon that i had did have an assistant um on the day um but i didn't realize that i would have been able to listen to music then which i probably would have benefited from because they kept on trying it, to it might them. depend on the doctor but yeah 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 um but uh yeah um uh, yeah the doctor and the, the assistant were like talking to me the whole way through i think she was actually like training to be able to do it um so uh when he was doing it he was like sort of telling her exactly everything that um what that he was doing you know he was like oh now you know i'm yanking this and <laughs> now i'm punching no, i'm joking <laughs> um yeah and uh and another thing to just like to highlight on before um that i mentioned that what happens to you during the process can depend on the person you get so the 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 surgeon that that um did my op he was saying that he like the the vast majority of his patients come to him as, as like a second third fourth fifth resort um because the initial doctor or doctors they'd gone to refused to do the surgery because he was saying that there's only a few um, surgeons in the UK that will operate on people that were as young as me. I don't know if like, cause you were 26. I don't know if that still counts as like really young or whatever, but he mm. was saying that especially a 23 year old, um, like the majority of people who, do vasectomies wouldn't have done it and so he says he gets quite a, a, a large proportion of young people to him um either because they've heard that he will give them or they just end up filtering down to him because everyone else has rejected um them did, um, he, did he say like why he is happy to do it when others aren't yeah because he, he he just said as far as he's concerned it's it's the person's decision if they want to do that they they you know it's up to them they're the one that's going to live with the consequences as as long as they sign a form that says that uh you know he's not going to be held responsible um then then he's he's happy to do it um as, as far as i can remember that that's what he said um yeah, but apart from that, like through mine, yeah, they were just talking to me the whole time, asking me questions like what I do for work, stuff like that. I had a nervous laugh. So I just kept on laughing at random shit throughout the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to go into just so we are like being real with um, everyone who's listening and like considering getting one. Um, did you feel any pain at all while you were like it, during the operation? Uh, no, I did feel. Not at all. It no oh. um I, I did feel the initial um we should have mentioned maybe, maybe it's obvious so these are done under local anesthetic yeah so you um, don't get put so, to sleep no yeah uh, so both lawrence and i had an injection of anesthetic into our scrotum right is that what you had <laughs> yeah i think just, so i mean i, I wasn't looking down okay. there when they were doing it but i'm assuming that's right they injected. That's what it fucking okay. felt like that well yeah so i i did feel that tiny like pinprick which isn't pleasant but it wasn't painful mm -hmm. i you know i was expecting it um <clears throat> and i think i did feel one of the times where they must have cut one of the vas deferens tubes but it, it's more like a sort of squeeze sensation it's not i wouldn't describe it as painful yeah. uh, so no the whole procedure for me was completely pain free. Um, obviously, I was because I was like so worked up and sweating and nervous. There was a level of adrenaline which might have helped me through it. Mm. But uh, yeah, I can't say I felt any pain. Yeah, for me, I felt a bit of pain, nothing unbearable, like at all. It was all everything that uh, like happened was bearable. But at the start, when they first like inject me with the anesthetic that did it it was like a sharp pain and it was sharper than I thought it was going to be because I I assumed it would be the same as like um if you were it was basically the same as if you were giving blood if you've ever given blood and they've you know put the um the needle in, into your vein it was basically the same sort of pain for me um just in a different place um and then after that, it just felt like you were being fondled, basically. Um, 
or like like manhandled. I don't know if fondled is the right word, but it just it just felt like someone know. was having a rummage down there, and and that was basically it. Um, but not um, in a pleasant way, right? No, no, not in a pleasant way. It wasn't like <laughs> I was going, ooh, ah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then, like, yeah, like you were saying, like, when they cut... So the, the first Vas Defron, if that is how you say it, the first one they cut, didn't feel a thing. Didn't even realise they'd done it. Like, he, he, he said, oh, yeah, now I'm moving on to the second one. And I thought he'd only just started on the first one. So it can be really quick. Like, mine was over in 10, 15 minutes as well. Um, yeah, the second one, I did feel it a, a slight bit, but again, nothing unbearable. Again, it was just uh, like you were sort of giving blood, that sort of level of pain. Um, yeah, and maybe another thing to mention, just, just if anyone cares, like your your knob is covered the whole time. Um, like if anyone is sensitive about that, like they, you know, they they try to keep as much of your dignity in, intact as possible. <laughs> Luckily for me, I didn't have any when I walked in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, apart from that, so what, what happened for you immediately post-op? Um, so as I said, yeah, I kind of got kind of sat up, uh, pulled my pants up, uh, and that's when I kind of said to him, like, you know, just thank you so much. Um, then I had to go back down into the waiting room and fill out a little feedback form. Um, Oh, did you not get taken into a side room and given like biscuits and a drink? No. Oh. Did you? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, when, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah. So when it had finished, um, I want to go and give them a, a four-star <laughs> review instead of a five. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when it when it first finished, he was like, "Yeah, pull your pants up," um, and then took me into another room. Well, well, the 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 woman who initially got me to sign the form, she then came back and took me into the other room. Um, and then uh, sort of left me on my own for maybe a, like a couple of minutes with with some biscuits and, and, a, and a drink. Um, and um, yeah, I, th I think I don't know if they do that on purpose for you to sort of like absorb what has just happened or whatever. But then, um, yeah, she she came back. She gave me like a booklet. I'm assuming you got the booklet as well. And she mm -hmm. taught me through the booklet and she taught me through what I had to do post op with all the, um, you know, like how many times you have to ejaculate and stuff like that. And I was maybe in there for like another 10, 15 minutes and then I could go. Um, and then I got a lift uh, back uh, from a friend, came and picked me up in the car and, and, and took me back. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I got a lift home as well. I kind of yeah. joked with my friend that I was going to come out with a cone around my head. <laughs> um, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the thing. Like if anyone's going through this process, the, the, the people who are guiding you through the process will tell you this, but definitely get organized a lift back, even if it's just a taxi. Um, but yeah, d don't, don't be thinking like, oh yeah, I'm going to be the brave guy who's going to, you know, cycle home or, or whatever. Mm. Just like, you know, like hopefully for you, unless it fails and it only fails in rare cases, but if it does fail and you have to go through it again, um, unless that happens, you only have to go through this once and recover once. So don't be an idiot and, and, you know, run a marathon the next day and just like ruin your recovery. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do we, we want to talk about recovery now or the kind of, you know, ejaculating and well, like let's, that. Do, let's do, let's do both at the same time, like post <clears throat> stop sort of like stuff you have to do and also recovery. Do, do you want to go first or shall I go or what? um i'll go first yeah. so the post-op instructions uh so, so basically after the vasectomy you you should you're told you should still act as if you are fertile because you don't actually know that it's worked just yet and that's because even after the procedure you've still got semen hanging around the tubes um so i think it was a little bit different between the both of us but i was told I should ejaculate at least 40, four zero times over the next 16 weeks, um, which is an average of two and a half a week. Not that I've done the math. Um, <laughs> which for some people, which for some people that's effort and for some people that's a fucking <laughs> walk in the park. Yeah, and that's all we'll say on the matter. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was told 40 ejaculations over 16 weeks. And then after that, I would then send a sample um to be tested for the presence of semen uh, and then i would be told essentially whether it worked or not 
Uh, now, ironically, today is actually the cutoff for me to send my, or like I can now send a sample. Uh, I'm actually halfway through isolating after testing positive with COVID. So I'm not going to be able to send it off until the weekend or, or maybe next week, unfortunately. Um, so I'm hoping to find out next month, February, whether, my, whether mine's worked or not. Um, what, what was your post-op instructions in that sense? Yeah, I can't remember the exact time frame, um, but uh, I remember I had I had my op at the end of February, like February the 25th or something. And the date earliest that I could give the sample was like mid-May. So um, March, April. So it's about three months, uh, around mm. three months. And I had to do it uh, 20 times, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 20 times. So when you told me you were doing it 40 times, um yeah i was i was surprised i i don't know if there is a specific reason for that or just different places recommend different things um mm. or different amounts or whatever but um yeah um and then i guess shall i talk about sending off the sample because you haven't actually done that bit yet yeah yeah so you're yeah so like we were both saying you'll be told um uh, you know, you have to ejaculate X amount of times, which, as Brad said, is because even though they've stopped new sperm going through the tubes that connects with the semen, there still may be sperm lying around in the tubes that could get into the semen, even if it's not new sperm. So basically, you ejaculate the number of times you need to, then you have to ejaculate an extra time. You have to, they'll give you like a, a, a test tube or whatever it's called. Can I get mine out? Because I've still got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah, yeah. Show. Yeah, show. Um, a test tube, that is. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, the tube that I have to ejaculate in for the sample. Um, and then I pop it in this bigger tube uh, <clears throat> and then just send it off. I think I've got to write the time and the date that I produce the, the semen. And then that gets sent off to a lab somewhere. And I think... I think it takes maybe two or three weeks to get the results back. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so basically you do that, send it off, um, and then uh, you get a... Um, so I didn't... I don't... Uh, I might have, but I don't uh, remember getting a physical letter. I just got emailed uh, a letter. and um, But you could get a physical one as well. But basically you get like a communication from the people... And they basically say, um, we can confirm that um, the, the, the semen, um, semen sample that you sent uh, was analyzed and it contained, uh, their leavers say it contains no sperm. So you can consider your, your vasectomy successful um, and you no longer have to use other forms of contraception. Or in rare cases where it's failed, um, they will say, um, or actually it may not have failed. So there can be two reasons that there's still semen. Either one, um, I guess you just haven't ejaculated hard enough and got rid of the, the you know, like the spare ones that are just- that, The Klingons. Around. Yeah, um, or it has failed. So I don't know about you, but I got given enough tubes to, to send two samples. So in case, the okay. if the first one fails, I had a, already had a tube to send a second one in. Um, which they test again and then if the second one also came back with sperm in it then they would say okay well it, it's obviously failed then and, and you either have to carry on as you are or come back for another another procedure um okay i've only got the one tube yeah so if if your one comes back positive which like it probably won't because it's rare to but um then i'm assuming they'll just as they send the letter to you they'll include the the tubes to send for you to send a second one um but uh yeah basically what when you get that letter saying that you know you're all clear um and there's no sperm in the sample mm -hmm. only at that point are you able not to use other contraception you can consider yourself like infertile before that point so um i guess we'll go into recovery in a minute but um, once you feel well enough to be able to have sex again, you can basically, there's no real like limit on, oh, you shouldn't have sex for this amount of time. You can basically have sex whenever you want, uh, whenever you feel um, like well enough to do so again, but you should use other forms of contraception until you get the all clear. Um, but yeah, do you, do you want to talk about your, uh, your recovery? Well, I think... 
one tiny thing I wanted to mention about um I, I'm pretty sure I, I was told or read that it's it's possible that your first one or two ejaculations after the procedure oh, yeah. there might be a bit of like blood uh, and that's just sort of debris from the procedure that's not like super uncommon yeah it's like um but i also think i i didn't have that personally yeah i didn't i didn't have that. um but i also think it's a good time to mention that <clears throat> say you get the all clear and it's worked and you can go ahead without using any contraception there is very rare cases a few years down the line of your body kind of repairing itself uh, so that you become fertile again and this kind of terrified me to be honest because i thought fucking hell even a vasectomy is not 100 <laughs> percent, even once you've got the all clear um so i think hopefully when i you know get the all clear i think just so i'm extra um confident i will maybe do like a sperm sample once a year uh, i don't actually know how i'll go about doing that it'll probably have to be a private clinic clinic i i, clinic I actually looked into it and i got a couple of links i'll send you afterwards oh cool i can include in the description as well hmm. um but yeah i just thought that was worth mentioning because i had this assumption that once it's done it's done and but uh not necessarily um which is a bit annoying yeah but, but again, I'll super, super rare. Yeah, it's it's super rare. Um, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's better to be safe than sound. So I guess like I'm I'm probably gonna once a year just send a sample off. You know, e even if it costs, you know, like what, like I don't know, a bit of money, um, mm. just to be like uh, safe than sorry. Um, did you have anything else to add, or did you want to go on to recovery? No, recovery is good. Sick. Um, shall I start this one? Yeah, so what I got told in that when when I got taken into that next room for 15 minutes and like debriefed or, or, or briefed about like post-op stuff, I was told um, don't do any, you know, sort of intense exercise or heavy lifting for two weeks. Um, uh, you like when you when you leave the clinic, you'll have like bandages uh, like around your testicles. Um and uh, you should leave those, well, this is what I was told. I was told, leave them on for 24 hours. Once 24 hours is, is up, then you can wash, have a shower or, or a bath or, or whatever you want to have. Um, you were told you could have a bath? Okay, maybe not. I can't remember that. I, I, in, I the back told, of my, in the back I of my mind, I think to, I was actually told not to, yeah. Yeah, I, I was told not to submerge myself in water for, I think, at least maybe 10 days okay okay yeah scratch the bath bit so, then. so showers yeah, only yeah 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 shower um once you've done that then they give you or oh, like i got given a second pair of bandage stuff so i could bandage it again um and then once those bandages were done with um then i didn't need them anymore um and for me um so i was so for the for, for about two three days afterwards I was not really going anywhere. I was mostly just like sitting down. I was working at home from the time as well. So I was mostly sitting down regardless. Um, after about four or five days, I could go for a walk around the block, like around my local area relatively normally. Um, after, after a week, um, and you know, my memory might be, might be a bit hazy, but after about a week, I could walk like normally and no one would, you know know anything was up with me um and then I, I, after after sort of two two and a half weeks um i could do sort of like light exercise again so maybe go for a jog or something like that but again i was wearing um i got these things that george actually recommended me them uh, compression shorts um and compression shorts like a lot of athletes will use them anyway but they basically just uh, keep everything in one place so i was wearing those for two weeks um after my uh operation um just to keep everything in place so I, th they'll probably recommend that but i would recommend to anyone get really tight fitting underwear just to keep everything in place you, you don't want stuff being loose and swinging about all over the place especially if you're going on like walks and stuff um 
yeah and then i would they, say they like, do actually um recommend you to bring tight wearing underwear to the operation yeah, if i remember true. rightly but just yeah, on yeah. that um i have these there we go there, there he is <laughs> <laughs> i i think i i wore these once i might have slept in oh, them really? to be fair okay. but it was it was super uncomfortable yeah yeah um, i bet you looked fit in those <laughs> christ <laughs> um so yeah i mean if anyone wants them i'm not gonna wear them again let me uh, know yeah so but, actually uh, there's a tiny story behind these so initially i actually got them but didn't end up <laughs> needing them because i i actually bought them after my op and they were delayed so once they arrived i was actually at the point where i didn't actually need to use them again so i then sent them to brad when he was getting his and they were unused at that point yeah they've, they've done the rounds yeah exactly yeah they, they've been putting themselves about like a, it's like a baton yeah who's, who's next yeah exactly we should get them framed or something um yeah so yeah that was basically it and then after three weeks i was i was basically back um uh to doing you know i, I would go on runs and stuff like that um and do exercise um i occasionally um if i would like sit down funny and and like you know squash something or if i was doing something that was particularly like jumping up and down or something like that a occasionally for a time after i would feel a slight twinge but um after like after like a month that it is completely back to normal and i think that i think that was everything worth mentioning for my recovery really it's just don't don't be dumb don't move around a bit listen you know to i mean it sounds kind of wanky but listen to like your body um and, and that's basically it try to eat healthy as well Is there yeah uh, so mine well i had no reason to kind of rush my recovery so i was i, I would say i was fairly um if, if I had wanted to, I could have done physical activity sooner, I think, but I just felt no need to rush. Hmm. Um, I remember the first couple of days, walk, I was walking very gingerly, but I think that was mostly a mental thing because, like, in my mind, I had this gaping hole in my sack, which just made me feel queasy. Um, but in reality, it's not quite like that. Um, so I did have some blood on my on my scrotum uh, and also on the underwear that I wore on that day. So yeah, it was just a case of changing the initial bandage um, and leaving that on in place. And more or less the first 72 hours I did spend in bed with an ice pack. Um, oh yeah, ice really helps, I forgot about that. Yeah, so I, I just used a bag of frozen sweet corn um, which did the job, but I, I do think that really helped. Yeah, <laughs> Again, yeah. just take, taking it easy leaving that ice pack on it for, for as, mu as much as possible throughout the day. Um, I remember I was back cycling within five days. Um, oh, I don't know if I'd have done that. Oh, really? No, yeah. it's fine. Um, just like leisurely cycling, nothing mm -hmm. strenuous. Uh, and I was back in the gym within 10 days. Um, I think it probably was a while, a, a couple more days until I was doing like heavy lifts again just like a mental thing but um yeah sort of light to moderate exercise within 10 days was 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 very viable um that's probably yeah about it really ice pack yeah ice pack the the only the thing that i forgot to mention which i think happened to both of us with is um there's going to be like a lot of swelling to start with I, i'm assuming it was the same for you like i had a lot of swelling at the start like you probably will have bruising as well. That is all completely normal, like to have bruising and swelling. Um, and and um, you do have like a dull sort of background pain in that area, not like anything intense, you know, just for um, maybe a couple of days, it just feels like someone has sort of kicked you in the bollocks. Um, or at least that's how it was for me. Maybe not as intense as that, but it was sort of like a dull sort of background pain for a bit. Where would you say you felt that dull sort of ache? Was like it actually in, in your testicle? Yeah, in the, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I kind of felt that, but it was more sort of in my abdomen area. And I was wondering, yeah, I didn't really know why that would be. 
yeah, I think like your abdomen is involved in like, you know, if you're walking around and you're quite tense down there because you don't want things to move and you're a bit touchy, I think your mm. abdomen will be engaged. So maybe that's why it aches. But I could maybe. be touchy as well. I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, that's about, about it for recovery, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I think the only other thing uh, to touch on is just like closing stuff. Like, um, how do you feel looking back on it? Would you have done anything differently? Um, and I mean, we've already covered it, but any regrets in any sort of way? It's a bit like what we would say about becoming vegan. The only thing is we wish we did it sooner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's probably the only regret I can say about having this procedure. Um, you know, I'm very much looking forward to getting my all clear, hopefully next month. And that will just feel like a huge weight off my shoulders because I don't mind like talking about this. I have, or previously have had a level of anxiety around sex because of the possibility of um, procreation. Um, so to have that kind of, to be free from that will, uh, will make quite a big difference to me, I think personally. Mm. Yeah, I'm basically the same. Um, so yeah, I wish I'd done it sooner. Um, and yeah, I can't think of anything that I would do differently. I would maybe, I mean, I think this is just sort of human nature. So even if I went back and did it again, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't actually in practice do it differently. But I think like, I just in my mind kept on thinking like anything that will go wrong, I thought oh, I'm going to be the one that it's going to happen to. Um, mm. And I just sort of worried too much, I think. Um, which, you know, is like anyone's going to do that, especially if you're going through an operation like this, um, which in the grand schemes of things is a very quick and simple procedure. But when you're the one having it done to you, it doesn't feel like that, obviously. Um, mm. So, yeah, I um, yeah, I would just say, like, if I went through the process again, I'd try to be more sort of level headed about it and not sort of think that everything that may happen will happen. But apart from that, like, I don't think I'd really do anything differently. Um, I might be forgetting some stuff, but yeah, I think that's basically it. Mm. Um, I think one thing that's, that I'd like to add, actually, <clears throat> is that um, even though I had this idea that it would be quite difficult for someone, say, under, under 30 and without kids already to be approved, um, it seems to be the case that it's still a lot harder for women to have these equivalent surgeries um I well, mean, they're, I've more got in, they're more invasive as well they're more complicated as far as yeah. i'm aware anyway yeah yeah they, they definitely are um but like I, I have a friend who's who's in her early 40s and i think she still gets told oh you'll change your mind it's just ridiculous mm. um and I, I guess that's sort of like you say partly it is a bigger surgery but it also comes from the sort of patriarchal idea that women are to be mothers and, and are kind of baby making machines. Um, so I just think that it's almost not a duty, but I just think if you're a guy, it's, it's, it's such a responsible thing to do, not only ethically and environmentally, but also from the perspective of taking accountability for ourselves in terms of contraception. Um, because even things like the pill, you know, women are expected to take these pills that affect their hormones and, and their bodies in all sorts of ways. Uh, and that hasn't sat well with me for a, a while either. Um, but yeah, I just think that's kind of worth, worth mentioning as maybe a bit of extra encouragement if anyone is considering this. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely a good point. Um, do you have anything else to add before we close off? Um, not really. I mean, may, if, if anyone enjoyed this conversation, then you might enjoy a video that I've got. It's not my video, but my friend Jeremy, uh, his channel on YouTube is Jeremy the Ape. And him and I had a discussion about veganism and antinatal, antinatalism and kind of how the two are linked in some ways. Um, so feel free to check that one out if you enjoyed this one. Yeah, I'll link that in the description. And actually, I can't believe I forgot it. And I don't know if you watched it, actually. And like, even though you've gone through the process, um, 
I would recommend you watching this video actually, because if nothing else, it's just quite interesting. But there's a guy in Australia, and I actually found this video from Michael, vegan space scientist. It's a guy in Australia who went through the whole process. He was super young, um, getting a vasectomy in Australia. And he received a lot of resistance and found it quite difficult, but he documented the whole process. And it's quite an old video. I'm not even sure it's on YouTube. I think it's uh, on uh, Facebook. It might be on YouTube as well, but I watched it on Facebook. Um, and uh, I found it like really um, interesting uh, to watch. Um, so yeah, I guess it's a bit like this. It's sort of uh, a sort of, you know, a person who's gone through it or going through its perspective, but he's actually documenting the process while he's going through it rather than looking back on it. So I'll try and find that and, and link that as well. Um, but yeah, apart from that, uh, if you've made it this far, um, thanks for watching. Um, if you, it, obviously like neither like Brad or myself are health professionals, neither of us are gurus on this subject. We can only, you know, speak from our experience and, and what we've read. But if anyone is thinking of going through the process, I'm assuming like you're welcome to reach out to me if you can find me in wherever I am. You know, if Brad can say the same if he wants to. Um, but yeah, also, if you've been through the process or you just have any, any general thoughts, leave them in the comments as well. It'd be interesting to hear how other people, especially people in other countries as well. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what it's like in other countries and different healthcare systems. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Uh, do you have anything else to add before we finish? No, that's it from me. Cool. All right. Well, just, uh, uh, thank oh. you for, for having me. <laughs> no, I'm it's 50, 50 <laughs> efforts. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for watching and uh, hope you enjoyed.